Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in this lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we're going to start looking at the long-tailed pair. This is the most complicated tube circuit we'll look at in this class. The long-tailed pair is a phase splitter. Purpose of a phase splitter is to provide non-inverted and inverted versions of a waveform to feed a push-pull output amplification stage. Now, in previous lectures, we've looked at the cathodyne phase splitter, which gave you these original and inverted outputs, but could not provide any gain. The long-tailed pair is a phase splitter that can also provide gain. The long-tailed pair is the most complicated circuit we're going to study in detail this semester. Now, later in the class, we'll take a look at the fuzz phase, which is also very complicated, but I'm mostly going to hand wave about it. And you'll notice that it looks like a self-biased AC-coupled cathodyne that's been mirror-imaged. And we're generally going to assume that these grid leak resistors are the same. However, the load resistances here can be different and often are different. So we'll need to take that into account. So this is the same kind of notation that I used for the AC-coupled self-biased cathodyne and cathode follower, where we're going to let RK equal this RK prime plus this tail resistance RT. Now RT itself is often a lot more complicated. We're going to just take this as sort of the simplest circuit, and you can easily extend what I'm talking about to something a bit more complicated down on this end. In this lecture, I want to focus on a small signal analysis. I'll address DC biasing in another lecture. The main thing to note is that these grid leak resistors are much, much, much bigger than these cathode-related resistances down here. And so as a result, as far as the small signal goes, I can essentially ignore these. Basically, the job of RG is to teleport the voltage down here at the cathode up here to the grid allowing us to use RK prime to set the grid to cathode voltage. Notice that I have two outputs. Basically, if you put your main guitar signal into input one over here, then the inverted signal shows up at this output and the non-inverted signal shows up at this output. Again, these can now have gain, which you can't get with the cathodyne. And we do have this second input over here, an inverting input. And this is often used in the power amplifier to provide feedback from the transformer that hooks the main output tubes to the speaker. You can get feedback from that transformer into this stage. That negative feedback provides some linearization, and it also gives you the potential to put in these weird presence controls that I'll talk about another time. Now, the analysis I'm about to do of this most complicated circuit we'll look at all semester is going to be the most complicated analysis I'm going to do all semester. I'm going to assume that you've looked at some of the previous lectures I've posted about doing small signal analysis on common cathode and common drain configurations. If you haven't, please keep watching anyway because hopefully this will be entertaining and the algorithm likes it when you watch more of the video. But do go back and watch those videos and come back and then watch this again. You'll get more out of it. In particular, I'm going to make extensive use of the Thevenin equivalents we developed. We developed Thevenin equivalents looking into the negative and positive terminals of the voltage-controlled voltage source that forms the core of the triode model. Remember, the actual triode model also has a dynamic plate resistance. However, this is something that I sort of like to leave separate and add in later. So something like this R top here is usually something like an external load resistance plus that internal dynamic plate resistance. Anyway, recall that looking into the negative terminal, we can imagine that what we see from the grid or the cathode manifests as either a multiplication by mu plus one or a multiplication by minus mu for the cathode and the grid voltages respectively. And we wind up multiplying the resistance seen on the other side of the VCVS by mu plus one. Whereas if we look into the positive terminal, we wind up seeing the voltage at the grid multiplied by mu over mu plus one, so something pretty close to one. And we wind up dividing the resistance seen on the other side of the VCVS by mu plus one. So keep this all in your head. 
No, don't run away. Stick with me. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'll do an example of the DC bias scene in another lecture. For right now, let's assume that we've already figured that out, so we know the small signal parameters of our triodes. And for a small signal analysis, we'll short the capacitors. We'll ignore the resistors here because I'm going to assume that they're so big relative to these resistances that we don't need to worry about them. And the upper power supply here will now be the AC ground. And that gives us something like this to chew on. And now let me go ahead and make a simplification. Well, it's not really a simplification, it's just a substitution. And say that we can replace the two resistors down here with the series combination RK. So this is what we need to analyze. Now we do have some general symmetry here. We have to be careful about the load resistances being different. But once I figure out what the output is for one of these outputs, I can just kind of flip the numbers around and figure out what the equations are for the other output. So let's focus on VO1. Now, as far as the inputs go, I'm going to use a superposition argument and address each of these voltage sources in turn. So let's start with VI1 and ground VI2. So essentially what we have here is something that looks like a common cathode configuration, except our cathode resistance is now this complicated mess over here. So let's think about replacing all of the stuff over there with its Thevenin resistance. So looking into the cathode, I just need to worry about resistances because I don't have a voltage source. I'll wind up with what I call here little r ki2, and this is the Thevenin resistance looking into the cathode. It consists of this load resistance RL2 in series with the internal plate resistance of tube 2 here, which I call RP2, divided by mu plus 1 because we're looking up into the cathode. Now, Pretty much you can assume that the plate resistances for these tubes are the same, but I found it just as easy to include the possibility that they might be different. Now, you could also include the possibility that the mu's for the tubes are different. If you wanted to do some kind of sensitivity analysis, you could redo everything I'm doing in this lecture with a mu1 and a mu2. I'm just going to go ahead and leave this mu. That's what everybody does. You want to try to use match tubes in this circuit, and if you wanted to play around with different mu's, it's because you're wanting to study the effects of what happens when you don't have perfectly matched tubes. The effect won't actually be that significant. But in any case, you might have slightly different plate resistances because of the DC bias differences associated with these different load resistances. But as I'll show you next time, when you compute the DC bias point, usually what you do is you just take both of these resistances to be an average value and get a single RL and just call it close enough. If you really wanted to take into the effect of the different resistances while computing the DC bias, you would probably have to do a spy simulation or something. I don't know of any easy way of handling that analytically. So now what do I have? I have a common cathode configuration. That's an inverting configuration where the cathode resistance now consists of these two resistances in parallel. So that's particularly convenient because now I can look at the previous lectures where we computed the gain associated with a common cathode configuration. And all I'm doing here is now plugging this RK in parallel with RKI2 in for the spot where I would normally just plug in RK. And what about the output impedance? And here I don't really need to worry about what I grounded or not in terms of the original voltage sources because when I'm computing the output impedance, I zero out all of the independent sources. So looking into this output terminal, I'll have RL1 in parallel with the resistance seen down looking into the plate, which is going to consist of that plate resistance RP1 in series with the resistance seen looking out of the cathode, but multiplied by mu plus one by our Thevenin equivalence that we computed. So this is just like the formula we computed for the common cathode stage previously. Again, 
I'm just substituting RK in parallel with RKI2 for what would originally have been just RK. And as a reminder, here's our expression for RKI2. All right, so what about this secondary input? Well, this is a little bit more complicated. But if you think about this for a second, let's see. We're putting the input into the grid and coming out of the cathode. So that's kind of like a common plate amplifier. And then whatever's coming out of here is going into the grid and coming out the plate. So that's kind of like a common grid amplifier. And that's why I actually like talking about the common grid configuration, even though it's not something used on its own in guitar amplifiers. Now, you can't just take the formulas for one amp and slap them onto the formulas for another amp and expect everything to work out perfectly because there's some weirdness in terms of the way these two things interact. But that's kind of the overall logic that we're going to follow. Basically, we're going to attack this by applying a series of Thevenin equivalents. So replacing all of this stuff to the right here with a Thevenin equivalent, we have something like a resistance, that's our Thevenin resistance, this RKI2 I computed previously, where you divide by this mu plus one because we're looking up into the cathode, except we now also have a voltage controlled voltage source associated with having this VI2 here, where we're multiplying it by mu over mu plus one. So that has that cathode follower kind of feel to it. Okay, now let's take a Thevenin equivalent looking out of the cathode that includes this RK. So we now have a situation where the voltage here, this mu over mu plus one, is being split over these two resistors. So I have a voltage divider, RK over RK, plus RKI2. So that's basically the open circuit voltage here. But now I have to have in series with it a Thevenin resistance. And to compute that Thevenin resistance, I just zero out this voltage source and say, OK, that's these two resistances in parallel. I have RK in parallel with RKI2. And now this is flat out a common grid amplifier. It's a little more complicated than the common grid amplifier I previously analyzed because in that case, I assumed that this resistance was zero. And actually, if I had to do that lecture over again, I would probably include a resistance here just to get us ready for that case. But we can work it out from scratch here. Okay, now I can use my handy dandy Thevenin equivalent looking down into the plate. We have our plate resistance here, it's RP1, because this is tube number one. And looking down into the plate, we see this resistance on the other side multiplied by mu plus one. And what happens to the voltage source down here at the cathode? Well, you get that voltage multiplied by mu plus one. And the cool thing that happens here is these mu plus ones cancel. Now, if you wanted to make this mu1 and you wanted to make this mu2 over here, you could do that and keep working things out. It's just not as pretty. Let's assume mu is mu is mu so we can cancel these guys. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw the circuit sort of horizontally instead of vertically so that I'll have space to write down the long equations I'll need to write. So if I take a look at this now, I have this voltage over here split across this resistor divider. And so I'll have basically this voltage here, which is this mu VI2 RK over RK plus RKI2 times this divider. So I'm dividing over RL1, so that's what's in the numerator. And then I have this string of resistances in the denominator. So the gain is just VO1 over VI2. So the gain expression looks like this. It looks like the same thing, except I don't have the VI2. So that's our small signal gain. Oh, I should mention the subscript notation I'm using here is that this is the small signal gain associated with going into input two and coming out of output one. Okay, so I just computed what the output was if we put something into input two and leave input one zero. And I earlier computed what we get if we put something into input one and leave input two zero. So by superposition, if I put something into both inputs, 
I should be able to get what the output is by just summing these two expressions I have here. Notice I have this term in common, so I can write the complete output like this. Now, if we didn't have this RK over RK plus RKI2 term, this would be really nice. It would be something just like VI2 minus VI1. But this term spoils the party, and that's why people will tend to use these differing load resistors, although not always. There are plenty of long-tailed pairs that use the same resistance value for both load resistors. So this slide summarizes all of the formulas I just derived for the output at output 1 and the output impedance at output 1. Fortunately, we've already done all the work as far as figuring out what the formulas for output 2 go. All I need to do is take the various 1s and 2s and swap them around. So if I want to know what the formulas for output 2 are, I write something like these expressions where all I did is I changed the 2s to 1s and the 1s to 2s. So this horrendous slide has all the formulas you need to compute the gains and output impedances associated with the long tailed pair. Again, this is a small signal analysis. I'm not really going to get into doing a large signal analysis of the long tailed pair. If you wanted to start discussing distortion qualities of the long tailed pair, that's something you would need to do, but I'm not going to get into it for this class. I think this is complicated enough for now. Now, if you look out and you happen to be analyzing an amplifier where these load resistances are the same, then there's a trick you can do that involves decomposing your input signals into common mode and differential mode signals. And then there's a clever analysis that makes all of this easier and has a nice interpretation. And I'll show you that in another lecture. But again, it only applies to the case where these resistances are the same. So I like to start here with the more general case. Now, in general, when I've seen people drive the kind of formulas I've shown you here for the case where RL1 and RL2 are different, what they usually do is they write down some node equations and they solve that system of equations. It takes a lot more time than the analysis I just showed here, and I don't think it gives you as much insight as the analysis I just showed here. Before we close out, I should say something about input impedance. Basically, there's something of a bootstrapping effect going on here, although it's more complicated because there's more stuff here. But basically, you do wind up with an input impedance that's a lot bigger than RG, and RG is usually pretty big anyway. So as a result, people don't really worry about the input impedance.